beginning is, is just the, um, gee, it's a little, vert a little horizontal, isn't it? Um, that's Palmyra, and I wanted to, the Roman ruins at Palmyra, and I wanted to uh, put, start with that because you'll notice the ISIS flag at the top of the, um, of the monument there. Okay, these are just a few of the recent headlines that have focused on terrorist crimes. Um, they've been prominent in the news. I'm sure you've seen several of them. Why is it not doing that? There we go, some more. Um, and then we have statements of, we've got increasingly desperate statements from UNESCO chief Irina Bakova. You'll see February, March, May, time after time there's an incident. She um, condemns them and obviously, there we go. And she was the reason, sorry, oh, having trouble with this. She was the reason, those statements are the reasons that I came up with the title of this, Beyond Hand Wringing, because basically that's what a lot of the response has been. And I think that we need to discuss, these are desperate times for these monuments, and we need to discuss what more, if anything, can be done. UNESCO is the key international governmental agency responsible for cultural heritage, but basically she has very little, if any, power. So, and as you know, it's not just ISIS. Um, we've got other kinds of conflicts. Um, Saudi Arabia destroyed some things in, in uh, Yemen recently. There's been commercial development in many places, environmental exposure, vandalism, aggressive tourism, and uh, natural disasters. And here are some, there's more cultural cleansing, iconoclasm. Here's an example of neglect, environmental exposure. That's the gladiator's house at Pompeii, which collapsed after a heavy rainstorm. That's development, that's in Yangon. As you can see, how much has come down in recent years. This is vandalism in, of the stone rock, rock art in um, Africa. That's Venice. And that is the most recent uh, earthquake in um, Nepal. I think that should be, there we go. Okay, there are lots of remedies to fit the crime. And it sounds easy, I know it's not, but these are some of the things that we need to be doing in many of the um, uh, examples that I've shown you. Um, but I want to get on to really to the ISIS problem because um, it's, uh, it's what's called a wicked problem, which means, as you know, that remedies are contradicti contradictory. Sometimes you can try to fix something and it ends up having a counterproductive of, of effect, exacerbating the problem. That was, that was an example of a lion that was recently destroyed. It's gone beyond iconoclasm to these new words, cultural cleansing and um, certainly annihilation. And as Michael Dante, who is an archeologist who's worked in the Middle East for more than 25 years said, we don't even know the extent of some of the damage. Um, it's, that, it's gotten that bad. Okay, a few people, I'm glad to see Bill Lewer sitting here in the front row. Few people think that um, the UN is gonna solve the problem. Maybe you can comment on this, but at least there's been some action in the, in the UN recently. The Security Council adopted a resolution in February, and, um, but it has not, it too is in problem. It's focused most, mostly on looting, stopping looting, and it hasn't adopted this responsibility to protect clause. No monitoring is in effect. However, the thing I find a little hopeful, and maybe you can comment later, is that the General Use Assembly, for the first time, unanimously passed a resolution, not just the Se Security Council, but the General Assembly, to stop the, dis the destruction. Many suggested remedies. One of the things, I have only four points on this slide, is, um, is that the Hague Convention is the main tool that we set up after a World War II to uh, stop this and to make it, uh, make sure that there was not, um, there, that as little damage as possible happened to it. But not every country has ratified it. The United States itself only signed on in 2009. Britain has not yet signed on. Uh, even fewer have signed on to the two protocols. ISIS is not a state, so it doesn't even, I mean, it can't sign on. And there's been absolutely no prosecution 
um, of uh, under the um, Hague Convention. Uh, one key aspect is that it obligates people to, um, or countries to um, uh, take, take methods, preservation methods and, and um, uh, ward off the, to ward off this in peacetime, and that's not happening anywhere. Um, other proposals that have been out there. Blue Shield is the, um, is the equivalent of, red, of the Red Cross. Um, it's it's uh, supposed to not only mark the um, buildings and monuments that shouldn't be destroyed, that are cultural heritage with the Blue, sh with the blue Shield, but also train the military during uh, peacetime. Um, other people have proposed things ranging from uh, pressuring Middle East governments to stop supporting ISIS on this, to obviously re reining in antiquities, trading, trafficking, more education on this. Some people have actually gone so far, opinion columnists in the New York Times and The Guardian of um, aerial bombing for them and um, uh, boots on the ground to protect them. Obviously, all of those have negative consequences as well. A few areas of agreement, the documentation, and these are just a few examples of what is going on. I'm sure we can talk more later. Um, conservation trainer <coughs> training, that's a wonderful guy named Moses who is the only conservator in, in all of Malawi. He's got the entire country. He recently trained at IFA in New York City and he's got the entire country to try to conserve, preserve. Um, <coughs> These are other organizations that have offered help, just not, not all of them, obviously, but some. And I want to end on a positive note. In the past, we have seen things reconstructed. Here are a couple that were, there was a museum in Berlin that was bombed out in 1943 by the Allies. Um, it had Syrian in antiquities from Tel Halaf, and that's what it looked like. They worked and they put things back together so that she or he on the right is what it looks like now after being put together. And this one is a scorpion bird man who was a mess and who recently was one of the stars of the Metropolitan Museum from Iberia, from Assyria to Iberia. And that is the end of my presentation and we'll go to Bonnie next and save, you know, save questions for all at once. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. If I could have my um, PowerPoint presentation on the screen uh, to, to start, but uh, I, I, in this very brief period of time that we have, uh, I thought I would focus on the, the theme of this discussion, uh, which is what can we do when we feel disempowered by the events that are happening in the world today? And, and it, it seems as if there's nothing that anyone can do other than be horrified by the scale of the atrocities that are taking place, not only in the Middle East, but, but all over the world. But I think if you put this in perspective, you see the world in a slightly different way. And in fact, uh, war has always been one of the major uh, uh, points of motivation of the preservation movement. Much of the work that's been done in this field has been done in the aftermath of catastrophes starting in the, in the 18th and 19th century with the French Revolution and the destruction of so many religious sites uh, that we um, associate with our civilization, with the history of civilization today. I think many of us don't realize the extent to which uh, these sites have been ravaged over time and rebuilt and reconstructed. And the preservation movement has its grounding in that process. Uh, but it was really World War II that set the stage for the uh, growth of this uh, effort in a more serious attempt to put the preservation of cultural heritage in the context of, uh, of civilization as it evolves. Um, <coughs> hanging in as an image on the horizon in, in that context is the destruction of Dresden in the very last days of World War II as a punitive gesture by the British uh, in response to the blitz that had occurred in the, uh, in specifically the bombing of Coventry Cathedral. So the firebombing of Dresden 
was a, a kind of intentional atrocity <laughs> intended to uh, repay uh, some of the damage that had already been done and perhaps made everyone in the world realize that we needed norms to deal with these kinds of issues that they'd risen to the scale of international diplomacy where no uh, individual country could just take set, make up its own rules. And that was the grounding for the creation of the Hague Convention that Judy just talked about, 1954. Uh, the, uh, probably the United Nations uh, charter that has had the least efficacy of anything that the United Nations has ever done. But uh, one that still uh, is on the horizon as a tool for this field and for the community of countries around the world to, uh, to do something to set aside the things that we value as civilization uh, in times of conflict. But let's just remember that conflict uh, is really the source of a lot of what uh, we have to deal with uh, in, in terms of uh, the shape of the built environment over time. Uh, but the preservation uh, movement has its feet in World War II, and uh, it was in the 60s in the still uh, aftermath of World War II that, that dis this discipline really grew, and the first programs, academic programs, at least in this country, were established. Uh, the founder of Preservation in America was a man <coughs> named James, James Marston Fitch, who uh, taught at Columbia and wrote a book called Historic Preservation, uh, Curatorial Management of the Built World. And that, I think that title itself captures <coughs> the idea of the moment, which was we have to save the great icons of our history. We have to treat them almost as if they were a collection. And that we have, that preservationists are in a sense connoisseurs who are able through their knowledge and their expertise to know what's worth saving. And those have to be the centerpieces of uh, civilization going forward. Incidentally, parallel to that is these re great reconstructions happening across the world that are identifying the ways in which preservation is going to uh, uh, play itself out in the, in the aftermath of the war. And here's the dome of the Frau in Kirka in Dresden, <laughs> rebuilt completely or ex extensively from the very same stones. Uh, that had been preserved uh, ever since 1945. It took until 2005 uh, for, and, and primarily after the war that uh, the, uh, East Germany was able to pull this together. And it was one of their great iconic acts of the post-Soviet period to reconstruct the Frauen Kirche because it was felt that this was so important to the sense of identity of the place and of the country and of Saxony that it really couldn't go forward without it. And so there's this uh, counterpart between the idea of trying to identify what we need to save and how it, play, how it figures into uh, the future of the built environment that these uh, reconstructions, which seem to be area guard uh, activities, are taking place. Uh, today we have a slightly different vision of the field, and it is more one about the context in which these monuments exist. And quoting another colleague I just heard speak the other day, he said, preservation today is the intelligent, thoughtful, and creative management of change. Uh, and I think it parallels the um, environmental conservation movement in that respect when we see tumultuous changes happening in the world. All the ones Judy's referred to, but uh, climate change being at the very top of this list. In the meantime, conflicts are marching forward. And uh, the Vietnam War, uh, during the Vietnam War, there wasn't any real effort to set aside uh, monuments in uh, conflict. Uh, several major sites in Vietnam uh, took hits, including the uh, Forbidden City in the city of Hue and uh, one of the major Cham sites. In Cambodia, the destruction was of a different nature. It was the effort to eradicate uh, the, the people of the country and the intelligentsia in a kind of uh, a, a, a crazy uh, totalitarian <laughs> effort on the part of the Khmer Rouge, leaving behind uh, a cultural heritage that was completely ne neglected and almost um, existing almost as a fabled part of the country's history, but not an active player in the um, reconstruction efforts. 
But it became a centerpiece of the country's reconstruction has resulted in international effort that started in the, in the 90s and is still going on today. We were big players in that. We, uh, World Monuments Fund came to Angkor actually in, in about 1990, even before the UN uh, movement. And our effort really focused on two or three principles that I think are the principles of what we can do in a post-war conflict. First of all, taking, a, taking advantage of windows of opportunity. Uh, this was a very dicey uh, circumstance at the, at the time that we started the Khmer Rouge. We're still very active in this part of Cambodia. And there were, uh, there, uh, what we found that we could do is put together the resources, the material resources, the most simple kinds of technologies like pulleys and uh, uh, jacks, and then train people and have them ready to be able to operate on our behalf when the window of opportunity closed, which it did on a couple of occasions during the course of, <coughs> of this 20-year uh, ongoing engagement. Uh, so seize the opportunity, carefully document and gather knowledge of what's, what we have, this site that had been neglected for 20 or 30 years uh, in complete disarray at the moment of encounter, and then training, which builds empowerment and morale in the local community. Uh, this picture was taken just last year when we had a little event at Angkor to uh, acknowledge people who'd been working as part of our effort there for 20 years at least. And all of, uh, you can see there are about 100 of them, uh, which I think is the other element that I'd like to emphasize in, in relation to post-war reconstruction, which is the, uh, the true morale building uh, capacity that the heritage has to unite people around their sense of their identity and a, and a common purpose, which builds uh, their commitment to the place and allows them to take possession of it uh, after uh, a catastrophic event. And then the war in the Balkans, where uh, we, the, this ugly beast of iconoclasm raised its head again and uh, the idea of attacking symbols of identity based on uh, ideological or religious uh, reasons was, uh, was front and center to the conflict. That little blue thing you see on that building is the shield of the Hague Convention. That is the blue shield that is supposed to protect the building from damage in, the, in times of conflict. And these were actually used as, uh, as targets uh, in tar the, the target practice between the uh, Croats and the Serbs. Uh, here's a, here's a uh, building in most are completely shelled to pieces. The town itself, the whole center of the city was essentially demolished in the shelling. But the centerpiece of, uh, of the conflict as well as the reconstruction was the Mostar Bridge, which wa was uh, rebuilt as a, a joint effort between UNESCO and uh, the World Bank in 2004. All new stones, the old stones, after lying at the bottom of this river were um, not strong enough to be reused. And uh, uh, WMF was involved in a lot of reconstruction efforts in the town. Again, thinking uh, that the principle was to empower the people, to give them the opportunity to t take the possession again of a place where the cultural center of life had been destroyed. And, um, the celebration 2004, 10 years after uh, the, de uh, the decimation of the Mo Star Bridge. This reconstruction effort was largely led by university professors and their students uh, going to Mo Star uh, every summer. A lot of students from Columbia, a lot of Americans participated in this in order to piece together all the documentation that we had of the historic center of Mo Star and develop a new strategy. And then finally, uh, this is a picture of Babylon at the time of the American military op occupation of Babylon, which was one of the unfortunate events of the, uh, of the occupation period in Iraq. Uh, you can see all these military vehicles all over the place. You would not necessarily realize that this was a primary archeological site of civilization, not just an army base. And World Monuments Fund was, uh, engaged by the U.S. Department of State in 2007 uh, to organize a project called the Future of Babylon, 
and we've been there uh, working ever since. Um, that is to say, sporadically from 2007 to 2009, we've had no access to the site. It's too unstable. At that time, we were able to bring the Rockies out of the country to help them gain the basic technological skills to do the inventory, do the uh, recording, uh, documentation, learn how to use these new technologies themselves. And since then, uh, on a fairly regular basis, we've had a team, a very small team, uh, working with them, I think very successfully, to preserve Babylon for the future. And um, I'm going to show uh, just a really short video clip to end my presentation. And I think it says everything that I've tried to emphasize about uh, what the objective of a post-war uh, heritage conservation effort should be. So uh, if you can just put that on. Babylon has captured the imagination of artists, poets, writers, and adventurous travelers for centuries, if not millennia. From Alexander the Great to the archaeologist Robert Coldaway, soldiers and scholars have sought Babylon in their quests for glory, benefiting from the wisdom and power that were once centered at this ancient city. Babylon is depicted in Renaissance paintings and 19th century images created by travelers on their grand tour. Its legacy has been the inspiration for mystery novels and popular films. Most importantly, Babylon has never ceased to fascinate students of ancient history and archaeology. Since 2009, personnel from the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and World Monuments Fund have been working together to ensure Babylon receives the conservation attention it needs. The first step in the process was carefully documenting the current conditions at the site. Several new technologies were used to advance the process, including digital photography, laser scanning, and GIS readings to find the exact locations of Babylon's structures. This allowed us to create accurate maps of the ancient ruins and the boundaries of the site. Laser scanning provided high-resolution images that helped state board personnel more accurately understand the conditions of the excavated areas and to create the conservation plans that are now being carried out. The images from the laser scans also allow the beauty of the famous relief sculptures in the brickwork at Babylon to be seen by many people who might never have a chance to visit Iraq but want to learn about the wonders of Mesopotamia. This project, The Future of Babylon, is about collaboration. Our goal is to produce a management plan that people believe in, that people feel empowered by, that people feel ownership over. This is the Tower of Babylon, the Ziggurat Temple Tower of Babylon, which is likely to be the tower that the exiled Hebrews were thinking about. Uh, in Babylon when, the, when they were telling, retelling the story of a great tower from their own past. You could go to the Saddam Palace and see a lot of graffiti from the various forces which occupied the site in recent history. The stakeholders ranging from the governor of Babel to the SBAH to local residents living next to the site, they all have a stake in this conserving such an important site, as well as benefiting from it. We're there to help them put the pieces together towards developing a future way of preserving and presenting the site. But the development of Babylon as a tourist site is going to be a very important part of Iraq's economic welfare in the future. We're going to see a lot of visitors passing this way.
was going to say, uh, we were going to, I was going to have some questions among ourselves, but we are so late. Prepare your questions. We'll go right to audience questions after Adam, okay? Uh, so if you can put the PowerPoint up, that'd be great. Um, I'm going to pick up where Bonnie left off with a lot of visitors. So the first slide that's going to come up was taken in the Louvre uh, last week while we were working to record um, a table from Saxony that actually links with some of the things that Bonnie was talking about in Dresden. But my talk is going to be uh, very different. I mean, World Monument Fund has done amazing work um, to preserve major sites. What we do in Madrid and what my team does is basically uh, try to convince all of the, the players. Um, so let me just see if we can get... So this was the photograph taken in the Louvre last week. And for me, the big question is, how do you actually study and appreciate art, learn from it, benefit from it, when there are this many visitors? Also, how do you preserve it when there are this many visitors? So there's been a major game change, certainly since the Second World War, where mass tourism has altered the whole way that we think about sites. So really what I'd like to start by saying is there's a very big difference between conservation and preservation. Conservation, uh, we've seen many examples in Bonnie's talk, which I think are marvelous and inspiring, of sites being conserved. But the actual preservation of what's important in those sites, uh, the preservation of what's important in those sites is really what I want to focus on. So in the background of the first image, was the Veronese painting, the wedding at Cana, behind, standing opposite um, the Mona Lisa. Um, this is where it belonged. So this is actually a facsimile we made of that painting back in its original setting, which is Palladio's refectory, uh, that was behind the boat in the picture uh, that was shown of Venice, exactly behind that boat. And in a way, uh, th this project started to change a lot of attitudes about digitization and about what it's possible to do with digital data. So if it's possible to make an exact copy that has the same surface, the same color, the same character, the same qualities as the heavily restored original in the Louvre and to put it back into its original location, what actually happens? Well, the answer is you can see it. So that's one very important thing. Uh, the uh, second thing, is that you start to question the relationship between originality and authenticity. So no one in this context, certainly not me, would claim this is more original than the heavily restored original hanging in the Louvre. But many, many critics in America and Italy and in Europe in general have said that seeing a copy of this accuracy in its original setting is a far more authentic experience. So I want you, as I start talking, to, to think about authenticity and originality. When I began the work that Blackcap's doing, really it was to try to convince uh, mass tourism that there are different ways of preserving fragile sites. Uh, this is a great example of a fragile site. Uh, it's Leonardo's Last Supper um, while we're recording it, where the whole way you see it conditions your experience. So. Uh, 400,000 visitors went last year, that's capacity, and 600,000 visitors were turned away. So you've got a major uh, problem in terms of management of cultural heritage. Uh, you have to go in through um, uh, uh, basically uh, dehumidifiers, through um, baffles that take out, uh, control the temperature, take out dust, and then you can see it for 15 minutes. For me, this fragility is something that we were trying to record. And I think here, um, Bonnie ended showing an example of laser scanning. So the, the um, lion from Babylon was scanned with a LIDAR scanner, um, and it's scanned to an accuracy of millimeters. Um, laser scanning can also be high resolution. So high resolution is a term that's used a lot and often used without a lot of understanding. So it can mean capturing one point every um, millimeter, which could tell you the bricks on that wall. Or it can mean capturing 100 million points every square meter, which is a totally different uh, level where you can actually look at the cracks and understand what's happening here. Um, but the fragility of sites, so tourism, uh, mass tourism is still the big destroyer, war, 
many of the other things, but more recently, iconoclasm has shocked people into starting to say, what's actually going on? How do we actually think of the past? And why are there people who want to destroy the past? Because I think um, for all of the horrors that Islamic State have done, there are very practical reasons that they want to destroy the memory of the past and they want to stop it influencing the future. So there's a, a real political agenda behind the destruction. It's not accidental. Strange twists of fate that happen was in um, 19, uh, sorry, 2004, we were asked to record all of the fragments removed from the site in Iraq, from Nimrud. So um, there was a lot of, uh, in a way, um, criticism within heritage management about removal of objects from sites. But in the 19th century, the big destruction in Nimrud was the British Museum. So it took all the things from Nimrud, and that would be an act that a year ago everyone would criticize latently or not. Um, but the truth is they wouldn't exist if they hadn't been taken out. So now there's a slightly different agenda about how we preserve the past. I mean, we recorded in the British Museum, in Princeton, in Harvard, in uh, the Pergamon, and in Dresden, and had permission to go to Iraq to record everything that was blown up in that previous photo. But because of the beheadings and the, the, the situation in Iraq, we weren't allowed to go. And now that's been lost. Had we been able to record it, we wouldn't have stopped the destruction, but we would have held the memory and been able to rebuild as we've seen in Dresden and as we've seen with the bridge in Moscow. So I'm gonna go through these very fast. And if any of you would like to look at these more leisurely later, this is actually what we did in the tomb of Tutankhamun. We took in high resolution laser scanners. Um, we took in high resolution white light scanning systems. We uh, took in uh, photographic systems and uh, color measuring systems, both optical and, and uh, scientific. We then take the data back to Madrid and we merge the relief data and the color data. We then take that data and we rematerialize it by cutting it back in three dimensions. We then print the color onto slightly elastic skins like human skin and fix the color onto the surface of the relief. So this photo I like very much, what you have at the bottom is the color fixed back in register onto the surface. Now really this is proof of the quality of the data that's been recorded. So the fact that in Madrid we can rematerialize a surface that is identical to the surface in the tomb. Then, because we were doing this with uh, politi political support, political support is a very difficult thing to garner, um, and it took me nearly 15 years to get to this position from the first communications with uh, the Egyptian antiquity service. But we then start literally rematerializing the, um, uh, the whole of the um, uh, tomb, the footprint of the complete tomb. Next, the trees in the background are Carter's house. So um, we actually construct every element of it with teams like Bonnie shows until you get to this position, which I hope you can see it with these lights on. But this is the facsimile of the tomb of Tutankhamun. So when you go into it, there is no, from the normal viewing distance, which is on the, the, the barrier, there's no uh, effective visual difference between what you're looking at and the original tomb. Uh, we also build a museum to explain what tourists are looking at, what the visitors are looking at. And then we start looking at the surface in great detail. To me, the fragility of these surfaces is the subject of preservation. If we don't understand exactly what it is, I'll do this, I'm gonna go straight past this. This is Nicholas Reeves's thing I mentioned yesterday, the discovery of Nefertiti. If you look at this, number two shows a vertical line which he claims is the edge of the wall. Number four, five, and six show a bricked up door. And actually, when you start looking at the data, you can really see it. And you can only see this when there's a separation between the color and the relief. Normally this is masked because there's too much information. So it's actually being able to look at the relief and study. Um, um, so this is his theory and the, the extension of the burial chamber. And again, I'd love to talk to you because it's such an exciting moment. Really what we're doing now, and I'll finish here because I know we're, we're short time, there's a bit more I wanted to do. 
But what we're doing now is, um, like Ronnie, we're trying to train people on site. So we're training local Egyptians and we're giving them all the technology so they can carry out the recording on site. So the, the big initiative um, in the Valley of the Kings is actually to ensure that they can do the work themselves with the technology. But then there's the second part. Islamic State's been a game changer because we have to move fast. So we have to use technology in a different kind of way. And the new approach we're doing is with only cameras. So this is a site in Lebanon where it's a heavily uh, decaying site. Uh, one person in one day with one normal good quality uh, 35 millimeter digital camera took 500 photographs. And back in the workshop, we can extract the three dimensional data from those photographs to, to a level that's um, sub millimetric. So actually, you can now study the surface. And if that was destroyed, you would be able to reconstruct it. And this is, in a way, what I'd like everyone to start thinking about. There's an absolute imperative to get people on the ground and to train them. And in Madrid now, we're bringing people from Tunisia. We're working with the um, Arab Center for World Heritage in Bahrain. We're working with different entities like, like Bonas, like the World Monument Fund to try to focus what can be done in practice. And I think, in a way, Judith's question, no more hand-wringing. What we really need now is action. And we need to use the technology that's available to actually do the documenting in case these things are destroyed. And to do the documenting because these things are being destroyed by time, by tourism, by war, by many factors, not just Islamic State. Thank you. So let's do some questions. <laughs> I really do think we are at a moment now with all of the things we've just mentioned that maybe we can get beyond hand-wringing if we can somehow harness the shock that ISIS has been, you know, caught, you know, forced everybody into thinking about it again. So who's got questions out there? Yes? So everybody out there now has a camera. And how are you going, all these inconveniences? Feet on the street, the people who are visiting sites, do they have good access? But when you can't get on the ground, get that data back into you, because you have to rely on That's right, but you know the um, you know the example that I showed you in Berlin. They didn't have the kinds of cameras or images that you had, and they were able to reconstruct some of many, many, many of the of the artifacts that were destroyed that had been t you know taken from Syria from Tel Halaf. So what you're saying is correct for your kind of reconstruction, but it's possible to use what you had said kinds of cameras, of, you know, shots from all over that would be a guide in the future. Okay, the next question back there. There are, there are um, microphones. Yes, in the back. Um, while the West was certainly very criticized for pl plundering uh, all of the values of the various uh, areas that they did exploration in, now with the threat of all of the fragile areas of the world, will, do you think there will be a change in the attitude of governments asking for their treasures back and museums being uh, having been made to feel guilty and giving back? Do you think there will be a change in museums' attitude about perhaps not returning things that have been taken? Bonnie, you want to take that? I think that the assessment is already starting to some degree, and I think there won't be a lot of repatriation in the next few years as we try to come to terms with what's happening on a daily basis. Uh, I think the, re the, the push to repatriation really had to do with the idea of, of recapturing a direct connection with those iconic 
objects in particular that, um, that, that the developing countries felt they needed in order to educate their public. Uh, and it's now uh, back on the table uh, as an issue. But in a country like Syria, uh, virtually every inch of the country is an archaeological site, and there's so much there that it's almost impossible to conceive of how you could protect it all and how you could even utilize it all to the benefit of the of the society. And, and uh, these these activities have been typically very much underfunded by government. The ministries of culture just don't get the kind of resources they need to work with. So maybe this will call attention to the need for more resources. Okay, Susan Taylor, who's in the front row, is the director of the, mu of the New Orleans Museum of Art and wants to say something on this topic. I just want to speak to repatriation because not only developing countries uh, were at, are asking for works to be returned, but developed countries like Italy, which um, mounted a serious and concerted effort to regain objects that had been illegally exported. And the idea that um, it is based on country law, their law, that those works um, rightfully belong in, in Italy. And uh, we, I was involved in several repatriation projects and it was really based on, on law and UNESCO, uh, UNESCO agreements as well. With regard to Syria, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but this spring the House of Representatives passed a bill um, that uh, allowed safe haven for objects that were exported from Syria. Did you mention that? I didn't mention it because yeah. it hasn't gone anywhere in the Senate. And so but it will. You think it will? Okay. I, it will. Oh. Um, and the, at, at, at first it uh, refused safe haven, that we were not allowed to import Syrian antiquities into the United States that resulted from looting. But now the House has agreed, after lots of negotiations, that that um, is allowable, that we will, as American museums, um, gather these works to protect them until the time in which the government is stable and they can be returned. Yeah, the British Museum has already said you know, it, it has at least one object that it, it has is holding for Syria when things, if things ever happen. Yes, Wendy. Let me go to today and not talk about antiquities, but talk about um, Cuba, Myanmar, uh, and other places that are f opening up right now, um, and are there plans to do things there to not only not only to photograph and, and, and preserve what what it looks like today, which is so seductive, but also to help uh, and the Cuban government uh, with this huge influx of tourism to protect um, some of their natural sites. Uh, I had a very good friend who was in Myanmar ten years ago. Was uh, deported by the regime back to Japan. So um, now things may have changed a little bit, uh, but a vast amount of destruction has happened in Yangon. It, it's also really interesting. I, I don't have the figures right in front of me, but the Chronicle of Philanthropy did a recent survey of funding for this kind of work. It's very small. For some reason, it just doesn't resonate with foundations and in individual donors. And so <coughs> these conservation efforts, these you know, documentation efforts, they have a hard time getting money. So I think that's one of our biggest problems right now. Yes, in the red jacket. And you did not mention uh, any of the caves such as Lascaux. Uh, I assume that, that they opened a side, I guess, another cave, a make-believe cave, but that was before all this technology. Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, so the Lascaux was an example done in 1986. Uh, when it basically was done from good quality photographs and modeled by hand. Then the Neo Cave in Altamira was done in 2000, and that was done using available uh, scanning technologies at the time, so they recorded one point every five centimeters. So effectively, both of those are copies. So there's a big, there's a, a very big problem. I mean, I, I mentioned it about resolution, but also it's about what's a facsimile, what's a copy. I mean, there's a big touring exhibition about Tutankhamun claiming to have a facsimile of the burial chamber, which was painted by hand on sheets of hardboard, and it doesn't look anything like the burial chamber. So there's an issue about what's objectively accurate and will give data that's forensically important for academics to study, hence my excitement about Nicholas Reeves' observation and other things which are more... Um, uh, virtual or more about presentation. They're very different Sunny, did things. you want to say something to this? Uh, 
uh, def the definition of what um, these digital replications um, good can be for uh, the use of the public is constantly evolving and all of this material is now moving into cyberspace and it's possible to, to access it uh, as the, the limitations disappear, what we can uh, do through the internet. So okay. it, it, there's so really an explosion in new technology. Um, they've made four Lascos. So, I mean, there's <laughs> Lasco two, three, and four. So yes, the, the answer is, as technology develops, I mean, Lasco gets, whatever it is, 9,000 visitors a day at the height of summer to see the facsimile. By the way, the, the original Lasco continues to deteriorate as a result of the interventions that took place uh, mm -hmm. to try to stabilize the environment when, they, when it was open to the public. And there are other caves that have been discovered since in France yeah. okay, that are, have never been opened. And we only know them through facsimile. The gentleman in the back, It was said after World War II, but I'm not sure it's its veracity, that the Allies and the Nazis, if I'm right, had a tacit agreement not to bomb Venice. As I say, I don't know if that's true. It may be because Hitler wanted it as his summer place. <laughs> well, Venice is not a strategic military. It didn't make much difference. Did, do you detect any trace anywhere internationally of the first world, the capitalist world, coming together with the unaligned and the, the second world? creating any such preservation treaties? There was a specific effort to avoid bombing cultural sites in World War II, uh, and it, uh, a very little known episode of the monuments mean a lot of scholars gathered in the Frick Art Reference Library and annotated the maps that the, uh, that the bombers used uh, in order to avoid things like the bombing of Pisa Cathedral. The city of Pisa was straight, but the cathedral and the bell tower survived because they had these maps. But that is something that's not happening now for future potential battle sites. I mean, we don't really know a <laughs> that's lot. That's actually of not true. Some of it is happening with the, with the Blue Shield of the United States educating the American forces, I think, that's but not so much in other countries. That's well, what I've I heard. No, that's not true? I think it's a, it's a question of who's involved in these conflicts, and, and um, they have not been conventional wars in the sense that we um, – militant groups who don't represent any government and therefore aren't bound by these rules and don't have any, right. any training. But the U.S. has, since the first um, invasion of Iraq, uh, had policies implemented on a military level to avoid bombing monuments. What it hasn't had is the capacity to follow through on the ground and prevent other kinds of collateral damage. Okay. Bill, if you have a question, fine, but I also would like you to answer what I posed earlier. Is this a moment at the UN that we can use to galvanize some action on this? Go ahead. Well, let me just say to Giovanni's point. <coughs> yeah, to Giovanni's point, um, many people don't know that the first target for Hiroshima was uh, Kyoto. That the people, if you use your, your destruction for the purpose of punishing, which they did in Nuremberg, I mean, in, in uh, Dresden. Um, and, and it was actually the Secretary of Defense who decided that wasn't a good idea to bomb Kyoto. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you. Uh, the thing is that today it's possible to get more through the General Assembly, as you, as you pointed out, and I think this is a, a new era. On the other hand, uh, the effectiveness of the UN is decreasing. Uh, so... Um, if you have a, even a more likely opportunity to move forward at the UN on this important issue, um, whether it will carry the weight that it might have 10 years ago or even 20 years ago, I don't know. Okay. All right, I have to, we're almost five minutes over. Does anybody have one last question or shall I ask one of the last people up here? Okay, my last question, and not mentioning your own organizations, if the people here could do one thing to advance this agenda that we have, what would you ask them to do? Bonnie. Show concern. What, uh, wh wherever there is an opportunity uh, for the governments of the world to realize the public cares about this, it's an opportunity to gain the resources. That we okay, Adam? And for me, it's all about education. I mean, as people rethink the relationship between an original and a way to preserve it, uh, then you'll come up very quickly against the kind of questions that will lead you to understand the importance of actually preserving the original. 
Okay, thank you very much. You've been a terrific audience, and um, I really appreciate your coming out, as I said. Thank you. Yeah, I spotted you yesterday, David. Oh, did you?